Hi, welcome to the Kindle Chronicles. Today is June 17th, 2022. I'm Len Edgerly, and I'm recording this episode from Ocean Park, Maine. My guest this week is Annabelle Monahan, whose debut adult novel, Nora Goes Off Script, was published June 7th by G.P. Putnam's Sons. I reached Annabelle yesterday by Zoom at her home uh, just north of New York City, and we had a good conversation about the new book and then also some of the books that she's written uh, previously. Uh, one uh, person who's mentioned is Nicole. That's the pu- uh, Penguin Random House publicity person, which helped set up this interview. And I mentioned her a couple of times. The nonfiction book that you'll hear discussed is titled, Does This Volvo Make My Butt Look Big? And that's a collection of essays that Annabelle published in 2017. Uh, a lot of them have been published in the Huffington Post and also in a couple of other publications. Her young adult YA novels were published in 2012 and 2014, Digit and Double Digit. Uh, There's a mention of a tea house, and her current book was going to be titled The Tea House, and it refers to a beautiful building in the backyard of the protagonist, the the narrator, Nora Hamilton. And uh, you'll hear uh, Annabelle talk about how she came to... uh, Imagine that as her writing place, also where a lot of the the plot of the book takes place. And with that, let's. Uh, this is this is a recording of the interview. Hope you enjoy it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Good. Okay. A- and uh, I've reached you at your home in upstate New York. Um, I'm just. I'm about 35 minutes outside of New York City, so not oh. quite upstate, but yes, oh, okay. I'm home. I'm good, so happy good. to be home. Yes, yes. I can see you've been traveling some, and you've got some more travel coming up. I do. Well, and uh, Nicole said that uh, you wouldn't mind reading uh, kind of the opening of the book uh, to get us started. So let's do that. No, that's that's a fun idea. And we're reading from Nora Goes Off Script, Chapter 1. All right. Hollywood's coming today. I'm not going to lose my house. Those two thoughts surface in the same moment as the sun starts to brighten my room. I've been paid for my screenplay, and the bonus money for letting them film here will hit my bank account at noon. Goodbye, unpaid real estate taxes. Goodbye, credit card debt. And to think Ben saying goodbye to me has made it all possible. I don't know how this day could get any better. I hop out of bed, grab my heaviest morning sweater, and head downstairs. I pour my coffee and go out to the porch to watch the sunrise. Well, let's start with these characters. Who's our narrator, Nora Hamilton? So Nora Hamilton is a made-for-TV romance writer. So think Hallmark Channel, um, who has spent a decade writing these formulaic TV romances to support her deadbeat husband and her two children. And when her husband leaves her she writes a more serious um, screenplay about her divorce that is filmed uh, on location at her house and ben the deadbeat husband uh, there's some great descriptions of of him Uh, he was so obvious in his confidence so annoyingly extroverted his energy demanded attention as if the people around him were all worshiping at the temple of ben and then at the corner of arrogance and cluelessness, you find the worst kind of person. I assume that's the address for Ben. The... That's right where you'll find him. Yep. <laughs> Does he have any redeeming qualities? Not really. Um, he He's, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to diagnose him, but he's a little bit like a narcissist. Right. Who has this feeling that um, of just intense entitlement um, and that everyone is so fortunate to be in his circle and he's about to do the next big thing. Um, But he's one of these people who doesn't want to work, doesn't want to put in the hours. It should just all come to him. Um, So no, I think he is. I think he is a one-sided son of a gun. (laughs) Well, and then the, uh, I I think of sort of the anti Ben is uh, Leo Vance who comes into the story pretty quickly here. What can you tell us about him? So Leo is the former sexiest man alive. 
Uh, and, you know, not that many people can say that. Uh, so he is a guy who's had great success in Hollywood. Um, and he, his mother has just passed away. And he is finding that, you know, when he looks around his Thanksgiving table, everybody that's showed up for Thanksgiving is on his payroll. Um, he doesn't have a lot of real relationships and he doesn't engage. Um, I think there is a certain level of success where you stop engaging with daily life. Um, so Nora takes Leo to the grocery store and he just can't believe how inexpensive bananas are. <laughs> um, I mean, bananas are really inexpensive. Um, and so he, he comes to her house and wants to stay because he's just sort of connecting to something that he knows he's missing. Right. I'd forgotten that part about his, his mother passing away as sort of a turning point for him that explains his openness to everything that happens with, with Nora. Uh, the other part that's important about Leo is how he engages with Nora's children. Let's talk about that for a little bit. What, what, uh, that's kind of a tough, uh, situation to imagine you're, you're, you're a movie star, you're living in this person's house and here are these two kids. What, what could go wrong in that situation? What does Leo get right about interacting with them? Well, I, I wrote this book during that those first lockdown days of um, of quarantine, and I was really I just wanted to write a love story. I just wanted to write something that was going to be really fun and just I wanted to give Nora this wonderful romance that she'd never had. Um, and every time I put Nora and Leo in a room together, the children would walk into the room. And I was like, for God's sakes, leave them alone. He might kiss her. I don't know what's going to happen. But that's the truth of the book is, you know, when you're a mother, you're a mother. When you have children, you don't have anything else. And it colors your worldview um, and really just every the, the way you think about everything, all of, all of your plans for the future. So it was one thing for Nora to put her heart on the line to have this big romance. Um, it's quite another thing to bring your children into it uh, because they become attached to Leo. And now all of a sudden three hearts are on the line. Um, so I think it was a very important part of the story. Um, I also do think that you fall in love a little bit with the man who is good to your children. Mm. You know, there's, I sometimes look at my husband with my children and I think like I have a, a full heart just appreciating how he appreciates our children. Um, so it was, the children became a very important part of the love story. Um, and it was also something that Leo was missing. So just being part of a family. I, I, I read uh, some of your nonfiction book and in the foreword, the essay about marriage was flagged as, you know, try to read this and not cry. And, and, and I, I got that. We've been married 37 years. And wow. the, uh, the idea that when you fall in love, it's not taking into account how your partner will relate to your mother's death or taking care of somebody in the family, that all of those things are just, uh, I don't know, they're just not on the screen because you're so wrapped up. But in, in this situation, Nora kind of gets the chance to come in at the kind of chemical level of all the lust and the romance and see how he is with her children. So it's almost a conflating of two ways of falling in love with someone that in the normal sequence of falling in love, getting married, doing all that, you, you don't really know till 10, 20 years afterward uh, whether this fantasy person is, is, is really going to be a good life partner. I hadn't I hadn't linked those two things together, but that is that is absolutely true. Um, and I and I think to some extent, um, the way to have a happy marriage is to be lucky. Right. Like because you, you have no idea, you have no idea what's coming. And, you know, wow, you think somebody's kind of cute. <laughs> that's pretty much that's all the information you've got at some point. Um, and you follow that to the altar. Um, and I do think um, I think that that Nora has a real insight and I think that that helps her to fall more in love with Leo because she has a real insight to how he can open up to children. Um, and you definitely see a different side of him, certainly a side that Hollywood's never seen. You know, she knows him now in a way that no one else does. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, some of the reviews, uh, let's see, uh, starred review in Publishers Weekly, by the way, called your book an irresistible adult fiction debut, which is nice. And uh, the reviewer said, after Leo is called away for, ner- for work, Nora must find a way to carry on and deal with her feelings about Ben, Leo, and the romance genre, now that she's actually put her heart on the line. I Did, did you have kind of a, a similar evolution of how you think about the romance genre in following this story as it unfolded in, in your writing of it? And uh, what do you think of, of romances? I, I've read a few because I've had a chance to do some interviews and I've, I've loved it. You know, I, I've seen things in romance novels that are pretty good information for a guy uh, you know, especially in the bedroom department, you know, like what, what, what do these women want anyway? And, uh, but, uh, uh, it is formulaic and, you know, your, your Nora's riffs on the screenplay she was writing are pretty hilarious. Uh, are there good romance, uh, romances in the genre? Uh, what, what, what's your sort of understanding of that whole really important, uh, type of writing in books. I think they're all good. I love them all. Um, but I will tell you, I, I spent a period of time watching a bunch of movies on the Hallmark Channel. And I would watch one, and then I'd watch two, and then I'd watch three. And then I'd have this feeling like, didn't I already see that one? Like, it, it's the same movie over and over again, but now she doesn't have a cupcake shop. She has a ballet studio. But it's <laughs> the same movie. And so I became really interested in that and the consistency between all of those movies and particularly the very specific female fantasy that these movies are selling to the viewer. You know, all of the heroines have a lucrative business that started out as a fun hobby. You know, they're a cupcake magnet, they're a party planner to the stars or they, you know, they sell custom wreaths during the holidays and somehow they only work that one month a year but they have marble countertops and it's gorgeous <laughs> you know it's very um they're, they're very they're loved in their community and the guy specifically falls in love with them because of their most off-putting quirk hmm. not in spite of but you know their obsessive compulsive disorder is very appealing you know that he loves how she's so organized uh I just found it fascinating. And I really started to think about um, how, how whoever's writing these movies wants us to think about ourselves and our own lives. Um, and what I realized by the time I was done reading this book, writing this book, I read it a couple of times too, uh, is that real love, like complicated love where there are children and there are bills and all that stuff is much more than you could ever fit into a 120 minute movie. Um, it's much more complicated than that, but the fantasy itself, uh, it, it holds up. You know, I, I make my living doing something um, that started out as a fun hobby. Um, and I want to be respected in my community and have some man love me for who I really am. Um, so in the end, I think I kind of had a respect for, for the story that they were all telling. So you say the fantasy holds up. You mean that even though it is a fantasy and it's been sort of treated in a formulaic way so often, there's some kind of truth in it that if you follow it, uh, it won't be a bad thing. You won't just be disappointed because your cupcake business doesn't turn into a conglomerate. Uh, What do you mean by the fantasy holds up? Well, the fantasy, I mean, it is it is a dream to think about making your living doing something that is very fun to you, you know, that you don't have to um, pursue something that's not interesting to you to support yourself. I mean, what if that's true? I mean, what if we could all follow our passions um, because all of our passions are so different? I bet if we did all follow our passions, everything would get done. <laughs> uh, I like it. I, I like the idea. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a, an ideal that really would work if it was possible or if enough people were brave enough to pursue it, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, well, and your own history is intriguing. Uh, English degree at Duke, uh, MBA at Wharton, and some time as an investment banker. Uh, and it 
I've got an MBA myself and a little bit familiar with some of that world. I was wondering uh, if you can recall your time as an investment banker. What's similar about being a novelist and being an investment banker and, and what's different? Well, I'd say they're both hard jobs. I would say there's a lot of drama. Um, there's a lot of interesting characters. Uh, I would I would say that um, when I was an investment banker, never in the history of the earth was there a person who was so far from her skill set. I I just I mean I worked hard, but that was not something that came easily to me. It was probably twice as hard for me as it would be for someone else. Um, but I enjoyed it. You know, there was just so much action and so much happening. Um, I enjoyed it, but I, I wasn't very good at it. Um, and being a novelist feels to me just like such a comfortable place to be. Mm. You know, there's no wrong answer. You know, the, the, the balance sheet doesn't have to balance. <laughs> um, you know, you, you can just make it up. Uh, and then if it doesn't work, you can change it. Um, it, it just feels it is such a comfortable place for me to be. Uh, and I love it. And I did not love being an investment banker. You must have had some skills to get through the MBA at Wharton. What, 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 what part of your skill set was missing, even though you, somebody had stamped you as an official MBA? Uh, I, 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 I actually have a big interest in the markets, um, and I can do math. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I can do it. Uh, I do not have in any aspect of my life a great attention for detail. Hmm. I like, you know, I like that first 80 percent and the rest of it ah, it's fine that's not a good job for somebody who's <laughs> right. really digging down into the numbers we've got the we've got 20 percent left on this deal let's have annabelle take it to the finish line no i don't think so <laughs> no no she might lose it on the way to the finish line uh, oh, you also had an essay my super embarrassing mom in which uh, a tribute to your own mother who's passed J- Joni lane and 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 you say something about taking the risk of writing a novel because you reveal so much about yourself, but you know, Leo's mother's past and that's a big deal for him. And it, it, it sounds like it was, you know, it, and your mother was uh, like a Skittle in a bowl of almonds and she was a softer, hotter statue of Liberty. Uh, did it, 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 and she informs your writing. I think you say at some point, do you, do you have any sense if, if your mother was reading this book, the part that she would love the most, I'm so touched that you asked that question. I'm so touched that you read that essay. Um, my mother, if she was here, would be so delighted that um, I think she'd be obnoxious about it. She would just be so thrilled about this book. Um, and I hope that, that the way my mother, she works her way into a lot of things I do, but the way she works her way into this book is she was a single mother. Mm-hmm. And I am not a single mother, so and I've had a fairly easy, a lot of support. My husband's wonderful. Um, uh, Nora was um, informed by my experience of my mother growing up, you I know, see. the scrambling, the the trying to make ends meet, the, um, the, the little bit of wish that she had somebody else that she could run something by. Um, and also the fact that my mother loved being single. Hmm. So, you know, the, you know, my father is not a horrible man, but the Nora's whole, when, when Ben left this weird feeling of relief mm-hmm. and her looking forward to being able to, um, to spread out like a starfish in her bed. Mm-hmm. Um, she just like that, that my mother would have been tickled by that because I think that's exactly how she felt. She very much loved being in command of all the decisions in the family. Yeah. And there's a great scene where uh, Nora is questioned by the actress who plays her in the movie and says, well, wasn't this devastating? Wasn't this terrible? And, and uh, Nora's probably channeling your mother saying, no, it's was kind of great. It was, you know, look at, look at the benefits to my credit card account that that deadbeat wasn't running up all those bills. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think that a lot of people find themselves in relationships where they're just working really hard to make it work. Yeah. And the minute you let go, you have you have so many more resources available to you. Yeah, this bandwidth has just opened up. Yeah. Um, now, you you wrote the book during the pandemic. It sounds like you had a pretty full house and you didn't have a tea house to go to. You were in some corner of the house. It 
five in the morning and earlier. Do you have any sense of like, what if there hadn't been a pandemic and you had simply followed the arc of your writing from the YA novels to the essays? And uh, do you think there was something about the weirdness of that time that enabled you to write this book or had resulted in the book being different than if you had written it without this huge worldwide disruption? I think for sure. I, um, I'd like to give myself more credit, but I think I never would have written this book if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Um, I, I had a sense, I think many of us did, that I wasn't sure that we were a going concern when that was all happening. And I had this idea rolling around in my head and I thought, you know, I might as well just write this book. Hmm. Like, I, what have I got to lose? Um, my children were all home, but they were sleeping till noon every day. I had a lot of time on my hands and I had absolutely nothing on my calendar. And that is a writer's dream. Yeah. So I just, I mean, I really spent a lot of time um, and just wrote this sort of all at once. And now that I've done that and we're not in the pandemic and I have a million things on my calendar, I'm writing another book that I'm very excited about because I've learned that I, I, I need to carve out time for myself to write. Yeah. And you, you can't sit down to write an hour at a time, or I can't. I think people probably can, but I cannot. Um, so I think I've learned a lot about what my quiet and what my time means to me uh, from the pandemic. Hmm. Well, if this book is, uh, is as financially successful as it looks like it might be, do you have any plans to build a tea house in your backyard and, and <laughs> kind of uh, go wild with your writer's space? <laughs> Oh, that doesn't seem like something I'd do, uh, but the tea house is a real thing. Uh-huh. Uh, it was, it, it exists someplace in Darien, Connecticut, in the mm-hmm. back of a house. And I saw it in a, a book that um, was published by a home builder. And I had the picture as a screensaver on my computer for a really long time. Uh-huh. It is the most spectacular thing. And it's funny because during the pandemic, I was not daydreaming about the sexiest man alive showing up at my house. I was daydreaming about having space <laughs> to go and write. So right. the tea house, it 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 is just become such a huge thing in this book. It has nothing to do with the story. But uh, that was my parallel fantasy to to Nora's fantasy. Yeah, yeah. And and so you put the sexiest man alive in the tea house that's what the kind of thing you can do in fiction right we could have had some chocolate chip cookies too i mean we could put everything we liked in there <laughs> um so you you've been on a, a real live book tour i think you you had some uh appearances larchmont and rye in new york and then santa monica california over to north carolina and you've got some more coming up uh, I assume there were some book tours when you were uh, had your YA novel out and before. What's different about meeting readers in person now post-pandemic than what you expected or, or what it was possibly like when you did it before? Uh, well, in my young adult books, I didn't really go on book tours. Mm. I, I would go to a couple of bookstores locally. I'd do a big event in my town, and that's uh-huh. it. Um, my publisher has put so much enthusiasm behind my book and I am so grateful that they've sent me out into the world. So this is actually a sort of a new experience to me. Mm. Um, I find that people are so excited and I, I can't quite get my head around how excited people are, but I think it's partially because we've been locked down for so long, you know, just to get out and talk to people and hear about what people are doing. Um, and I, it is it is just I don't think this is the same way with any other line of work, but like I put my whole heart into this book and to sit there in front of somebody who is saying that they have received my whole heart and they've liked the book. It is um, it's really like the ultimate human experience. Hmm. It's it's really it's been incredible. And I don't think I mean, it's you know, it's wonderful to talk to people online. Um, but you get longer, more conversations. You go a little deeper in person. And I've just, it's been wonderful. Well, you have that physical, the time when you sign someone's book. I mean, you, the exchange between the author and the writer becomes uh, physical at that point. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. What, what does that feel like in person when you're putting this thing out in front of a group of people at, at a bookstore and you're feeling that they've received your gift, they're touched by it. 
does it make you humble or emboldened to take more risks? I mean, what what what's the sort of emotional thing that changes when when you have a chance to go through that experience, not just once but several times throughout the tour? Well, I'm going to be honest because I'll tell you the truth. It makes me really worried they're not going to like my next book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. because it feels so good. Like, I just am so happy that people have connected to different parts of this story. And then I think, God, I want to do this again. Yeah. And that, that's a trap. You know, that's like the trap of not being present and not just enjoying the gift that you're being given in the moment. So I have to really watch that. Yeah. I would think, too, there's some randomness to because each person who has that reaction probably is responding to a different part of the book. And if you're just chasing the reaction, so, well, I better have a, a movie star on the next one, or I better do this, do that. And, and you would be chasing a phantom because it's so unpredictable what any of us love. In I agree. Any art, not just, this story. is something I think about all the time. Um, this chasing of writers. Um, I think it's so tricky when you think um, I want to write the next gone girl. Uh-huh. And then you try to do that. And that's not the story that's in you, right? You, should, you shouldn't write the next anything. You should, and not even the next novel that is like the one you just wrote. It has to be the thing that is speaking to you in the moment, because that's going to come out in the most authentic way. And there's a, this is in the story, too, because she writes a, another formulaic romance, and I, I think it's her agent says, no, 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 you got to tell the real story of what happened with you and Leo. I suspect the when you're thinking about the next thing, if it's real and genuine, it's going to scare you to death that you would go there. It, it's the, which I guess is just the fear of being honest and revealing yourself. Yeah. And if you're not feeling all those things, um, I don't think it's worth doing. You know, yeah. it's, that's, that's when you know you're, you're, you're pushing yourself a little bit. Um, I, re- I worked on a book for a couple of years before this book um, and I was so bored writing it. And I realized that it's so boring. To and repeat so, yourself. It's just not. It's just not an interesting story. Uh-huh. So if, if you're if you're sto- if you're not excited and feeling like a little, you know, ripped open by what you're writing, probably your readers aren't going to feel that way either. Yeah, yeah. Is Leo like your husband Tom in any important ways? Uh, Leo is not like my husband Tom in any way at all uh ben, was that a ground rule that you you promised that <laughs> this would be the case or did it just happen that way it just happened leo just walked into the room uh-huh. he just was a a person that i conjured uh if you made a chart of ben's personality traits he's the polar opposite of my husband i see yeah so that that is he's the anti-tom yeah um but leo no i don't know anybody like leo huh wow He'd be fun to meet if you if you're he run sure across him. <laughs> he sure would be. Has there been any nibbles about optioning this for for a movie, which would make it the most meta movie of all time? It's a, it'd be a movie based on a book about a movie based on a a book based right? on a movie. And then what if I could write the screenplay and I could write the screenplay in my tea house? Yes. Uh, I might have yes. to change my name. Yes, no, we, it would be so. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's lots of talk about it. Uh, yeah. Nothing. Nothing yet. And I get lots of messages about who should play Leo. Oh, yeah. Who should play Nora. Right. That's uh, a fun game. That's good. It's a really fun game. Yeah. I'll show my age. I, I pictured George Clooney as uh, Leo, but I, I think you said Matthew McConaughey would probably have the inside track in your mind. You know, I, I, the person I thought of was um, Leslie Mann. Oh, for Nora? And, for Nora, because yeah. she's that right kind of sexy, funny, uh, sweet. I know. I just love Leslie. Leslie Mann. I don't know her. What? What? She? She's a movie star. Oh, so she is a movie star. She was in This Is Forty. I'm not going to be able to think of all of Leslie yeah. Mann's movies right okay. now, but she is. Um, she's married to Judd Apatow, which is oh, why okay. I thought of it because I yeah. was listening to a podcast with him. Huh. And then when I was picturing her. I pictured her with Matthew McConaughey. So hopefully they listen to your podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put them right in touch with uh, Nicole and we can just get this done. That would be yes, great. Yes, let's get it done. <laughs> uh, 
What can you say, uh, if anything, about your current writing projects? What 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 appears to be next for that? So I'm anything? I'm finishing up a manuscript right now, um, mm-hmm. and it is another summer read. Um, it's it all takes place at the beach, mm. and it's dual timeline, past and present, which is hard, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's like next level, more complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's another love story. Hmm. Hmm. Why do you read Pride and Prejudice almost every year? I just love it. It's a cozy thing for me. It's the way um, I read it, the way people watch the same Christmas movies over mm-hmm. and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, there is so much humor and truth in that story. Um, and I also love the yearning. I love yearning. Mm-hmm. I love the thing that comes before the thing more than I love the thing. Mm. Um, and I love to think of her, you know, wandering the moors, hoping that Mr. Darcy's going to show up. Mm. Um, I just love it. Hmm. Do you see different things each time? I mean, if you've been doing this for decades, you're... Your 20-year-old self sees one thing and your 50-year-old yes. self sees something else? Yes, probably. Uh, my 50-year-old self doesn't know my 20-year-old self, so we <laughs> we don't even talk about books together. <laughs> would, would you like her? I think she's fine. She should yeah. get her act together. But <laughs> <laughs> Would you say don't go into investment banking, get yourself to an MFA program? Or? Uh, no, I wouldn't, actually. I uh, If I could go back, I don't think I would change anything. Huh. Uh, I, I think that I learned uh, wonderful grit from having that job. Um, I think I learned a lot about people. Um, I think it was probably good for my brain. Mm. And I, I don't think that I was ready to do any of the things I did until I did them. Wow. I wasn't ready to write this book until I was 50. I mean, right. I couldn't have written it 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So. I suspect the the financial background has also been helpful. I mean, you have a publisher. It's not like you're in self-publishing where you have to sort of replicate all of that. But as an author who understands how to do math and and finances, is is that an advantage? I think it's an advantage uh, just to being a person, you know, to managing your life and knowing how much of what you can do and sort of what your future looks like. I think it's, you know, I think that's a survival skill. Right. Um. But yes, no, I don't. I don't deal with any of the, the the math or the numbers, and I don't check the numbers. I have no idea if anyone's buying my book. Um, no way. How do you do that? I don't know. It's much better for me. And yeah. if if the answer was great, it would make me anxious. Yeah. And if the answer was terrible, it would make me anxious. So I'm just happy to know that some people like my book, uh-huh. and I get to talk to you today. Huh. That's as far as I'm willing to take this. Did, uh, were you that way through all of the books you've published, or is this a recent uh, enhancement of your character? Yeah, that's a good question. I I actually don't have any idea how much I how many of my books that I that I sold. Huh. Uh, yeah, no, I just I, I feel like I can enjoy it more if I'm not yeah. trying to win. Ah, you know, yeah. if, if this doesn't feel like a business. I mean, right. this feels this is this has brought me so much joy. Mm-hmm. Just writing this book is frankly the most fun I've ever had in my life. Um, so I kind of just want to sit in that joy. And then and someone when, sends me a check. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And and by comparison, when you're doing the readings and you're getting a, a human response from people, I mean, that has its own challenges, as you said, but it doesn't uh, that's not a winning thing. That's just more of a connecting thing. Yes. And that, that feels like, that feels like enough. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a feeling like, Oh, if this book doesn't hit some sort of accolade, this won't have been a positive experience for me. This has already been an unbelievably positive experience for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a positive experience to, I had my wife read it and we've been passing it around. So, uh, uh, I love the fact that my name is Leonard and, Leo is kind of in Leonard, so I I, I, I learned some tips from him. Are we going to start a rumor here that Leo <laughs> is actually based on you? Yes, yes, <laughs> let's, let's do that. If we say it enough times, you know, uh, somebody will start believing it. I think we tweet it three times. Okay, and that'll do it. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I have been speaking with Annabelle Monahan, author of Nora Goes Off Script, published this month by G.P. Putnam's Sons, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Thanks very much, Annabelle. Thank you. This is wonderful. 
Oh, that was great fun. Uh, Darlene uh, read the book, as I had mentioned, and she enjoyed it a great deal, as did I. It, it, it moves along, and uh, the characters, Leo and Nora, the, all the, and the kids as well, as, as you can tell from the conversation. One of the things which I took from that uh, talk with Annabelle has to do with her uh, making sure that she's not repeating herself. And that flowed out of when she was talking about the pleasure of doing these readings, in-person readings on her book tour, and uh, putting her whole heart into the book and then having people receive the book and like it. Uh, I, I really got a feeling of what that must be like. And then her very honest reply about the thing that she most worried about is whether she would be able to do it again and realizing that's a trap and not just r repeating herself. Uh, and when I see that the uh, books that she's written so far have uh, alternated genres, she started out in YA and then she did essays and now she's written a novel. I think she's an example of somebody who's not afraid to write whatever is really speaking to her in the moment, as she said. I'll say that it, I, I think it was uh, helpful to me in thinking about the podcast, and I'm coming up on, it'll be a year in August, I think, since I uh, took a break from the show after 13 years of doing it weekly and then moved to, uh, not sure, I wasn't sure how often I would do it, but now I'm doing it at about a monthly pace, although this month we've got two uh, author interviews. And what's speaking to me in the moment tends to be more about authors, uh, quite a bit about contemplation, my meditation practice. I've started a course online through the Center for Action and Contemplation with Cynthia Bourgeau, which is a study of Mary Magdalene, which I think is going to be fascinating. Less following all the ups and downs in the news out of Amazon and Kindle technology news. You know, when something breaks, I, I, I'm sure I'll jump into it. And I have some worry about it that uh, those of you that have followed the show for years, <laughs> I, uh, I hope it's not sort of a, uh, a bait and switch. You no, know, you thought you were signing on to something called the Kindle Chronicles and you were going to be getting tech tips and you're going to be getting news of Amazon. And it's pretty clear that for me to engage with this project at the kind of level that Annabelle's talking about in her writing and to have it be fresh and to have it be something that's uh, really speaking to me in the moment, at, at least for now, there's much less of that coverage of Amazon and the technology and a lot more about the creative process, which I enjoy learning about when I talk to authors and who knows what, you know, I, I, I feel a freedom to have the interviews be with people who are doing interesting things, not necessarily always authors. But, boy, I tell you, some great books come my way. And I've just started reading a book called Midcoast, which is about a town just north of here in Maine. It's a, it's a novel and was uh, very favorably reviewed in the New York Times Book Review this, this last week. Uh, I haven't been invited to interview the author, but because it's a Penguin Random House author, some of my contacts there, I might have a chance to, to interview the guy, which would be great. Because when I read a book and I enjoy a book and, and I know that I'm going to be talking to the author, it, it's, a, it's a very different kind of a read that I do. I'm doing highlights on my Kindle and then I'm looping back and I'm listening to other interviews. And, and the whole process really uh, embeds a book into my consciousness in a way that just reading it for pleasure doesn't do so that's kind of an update on <laughs> how i'm thinking about the the podcast and and i'd be interested to, to hear from any of you new new listeners or old you can send me an email at podchronicles at gmail.com and i'm still doing the morning journal uh, every weekday uh, and you can uh, get that by telling your echo device to enable morning journal and then just say uh a flash and and those are five-minute snippets that I do each weekday. And uh, a lot of times I'm preparing for something like the interview with Annabelle and, or just talking about I'm sitting out on the beach here thinking about my family or, or whatever comes up. It's a, it's a wonderful way to start the day. And uh, I've got uh, a following of friends and family that means a lot to me knowing that there are people out there listening to it. That's it today for... 
uh, from Ocean Park. The ocean is calm out there. I'm looking out the window here at the desk where I started the podcast back uh, almost 14 years ago, and it's great to be back here. It's, there's not much air conditioning here in the cottage. We bought a Amazon Basics uh, standalone air conditioner which I haven't we haven't had to fire up it's been pretty cool here this week so far but when when it really gets hot I just my solution is to enjoy sweating which which happens a fair amount in this old cottage uh hope you have a good week and thanks for listening